Brothers and sisters, as I mentioned, today is Trinity Sunday, and as such, our passage that we are looking at this morning speaks about the Trinity, and uh, it will we'll pull out and understand uh, hopefully a little bit more about the, the nature of the Trinity and why it is important to us, why it matters to us. Our passage today is from Romans chapter 8, verses 9 to 17. 9 to 17. Romans chapter 8, verses 9 to 17. And just to remind you a little bit before we get into the actual reading, the book of Romans is Paul, the Apostle Paul, his letter to the people of Rome, to the Christ followers of Rome, sort of introducing himself, as it were, uh, before he gets there. He, ho he hopes to come there soon, uh, but he hasn't been able to yet. He longs to go there and see the Christians in Rome, uh, but he hasn't had a chance. And he wants to tell them a bit about himself, who he is and what he believes and uh, why he's coming and so on. And so um, that, is, that is really neat in itself, that Paul writes this sort of letter of introduction for himself. But it is also so valuable to us because in the, the book of Romans, the letter of Romans, Paul sort of articulates his most uh, coherent and, and put together um, organized sort of summary of the gospel his understanding of the gospel. And so, you know, uh, my seminary professors, they, they would talk about systematic theology. And a, a, a systematic theology is a, a, a theology, a, a huge honking book usually, a, a theology that goes through point by point by point by point and tries to summarize all of the essential details of the gospel. And, and, Romans is the closest thing we have to Paul's systematic theology. And so it's incredibly critical to, to uh, not only the people of Rome at his time, but also to us. And so here in this particular passage, Paul is speaking about how the Romans, the Roman Christ followers, are, are no longer in the flesh uh, in other words, uh, it, it doesn't mean that uh, they have some, somehow stopped being physical beings, but rather, uh, Paul, in this case, that term flesh is refer referring to uh, that sort of unredeemed state where Christ has not washed us from our sins yet because we have not received that, that gift um, and our desires, our thoughts, our everything are still targeted after the sinful desires. Now, we have to be really careful because there's a tendency among Christians to sort of uh, oversimplify this and to start to think, okay, uh, the body, the physical things of this world are bad and the spiritual things of this world are good. That's not what Paul's saying here, and that's not what the gospel says. And, in fact, that is one of the very key things that Paul fought against, was this idea that somehow the body, the physical, is bad and the spiritual is good. Not true. That's not what Paul's saying. Paul, in fact, acknowledged that we are just as David said, fearfully and wonderfully made. We were designed to be both physical and spiritual beings together in one. In fact, even when we die, we will be resurrected again as physical beings. That is God's plan and intention for us, to remain always as both physical and spiritual together. And physical and spiritual together is profoundly good when it is submitted to God. 
So just needed to get that out of the way. But let's read what Paul has to say, remembering that flesh here is referring to the sinful nature, not to just being physical. Okay. Romans chapter 8, verses 9 to 17. You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the spirit. And the NIV that I am reading from has spirit capitalized, as in Holy Spirit. Not just any spirit or the spirits or something like that, but the spirit, the realm of the spirit. You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies, because of his spirit who lives in you. <clears throat> Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it is not to the flesh to live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are called the children, are, are, excuse me, are the children of God. The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship <coughs> and to daughterhood, I guess. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we also may share in his glory. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, brothers and sisters, as with many of Paul's writings, there is an awful lot to unpack in this little passage. As I said, Paul is going through his sort of the closest thing we have to a systematic point-by-point -point, uh, theology we have from him, explaining to the Romans what he believes about who he is, about who they are, about who God is, and so on. And, and part of that is recognizing that, that Christ followers are no longer what they were, and so they need to live as if they are no longer what they were, right? And one of the better illustrations that I've ever heard about this uh, is a, an adoption illustration. And, and I'm going to share that, recognizing that it wasn't originally mine, uh, but I, I'm sorry, I cannot recall exactly where it came from. But the idea is this. Let us say that you had... Um, you and your family, you had uh, come into contact with, with a kid who has been in the foster system, who was uh, born into a broken home, who was given up for uh, adoption, but however, uh, no adoption happened perhaps right away, or, or perhaps that child was taken away from their home because it was so broken. And, and that child has bounced around the foster system from home to home and has experienced all kinds of terrible things. But not only only has that child experienced all kinds of terrible things done to them, but so too that child has picked up a, a lot of difficult and bad, quite frankly, uh, habits and, and ways of living and being, right? They have picked up all kinds of things that are not good. However, you search your hearts and you feel that God is calling you to bring this child into your home, to not only bring them into your home, but to adopt them 
to make them your son or daughter. And so you do. The child comes into your home and you know that there is going to be a significant amount of, of difficult transition. This is, this is understood. But you also know that you have been called to make this child your own just as much as any of your biological children might be your own. And so you sit at the supper table on that first night. And there is joy and there is celebration, but there is also hesitancy and, and, and awkwardness. And the child, the child you have adopted, reaches right off in front of their neighbor on the table and grabs something in front of them to serve themselves and there has not been a single please or a please pass or a thank you, but just a grab and go. And it's such a little thing, but it's, it's not what you do in your house. And so you say to this new member of your family, son, daughter, you are now a Zelstra, or a Dykema, or a De Kroon, or a De Young. I guess I'm stuck on D names, <laughs> except for Zelstra, of course. And, and, and we do something different. We ask for people to pass. Please pass the butter. Please pass the potatoes. There is no doubt and no question that you are now part of our family. You are and will be forever part of our family. We love you. And this is what we do. Zelstras say, please pass the butter. Dykemas say, please pass the potatoes and thank you very much. You see, the child has been adopted. There's no question about that. It's not like there's a threat to send them away. No, 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 no. There is a commitment. There is a promise that no matter what, this child will be part of your family. And yet this child still needs to learn to live as if he or she was a dykema, because they are. They need to learn how, what that looks like and live by it, right? This is kind of what Paul is saying. Paul is saying, look, you have been adopted <coughs> into God's family, excuse me. You have been adopted into God's family, and now you have an obligation not to live any more like you used to before you were adopted by God, but now to live as a member of God's family. And this is where the Trinity comes in. See, this is really, really important. People often sort of say, oh, the Trinity is such a hard sort of uh, doctrine to sort of understand. People struggle with it. And, and quite frankly, it is tough to struggle with. It's complicated. And it's something beyond our comprehension. But at the same time, it is so critical. People ask, why does it matter? Why does it matter? Why can't we just say, okay, it's God? right? But it matters. And I'll tell you why it matters. It matters because John says, under the inspiration of the Spirit, John says, God is love. Think about that for a moment. God is love. It is possible to be righteous without anyone else around. 
It is possible to be holy without anyone else being there to see it. It is possible to, to, be, um, to be just without anyone else to see it. But it is not possible to be love without anyone to love. It is not possible to be love without anyone to love. And so when, when, when John says God is love, John is saying something more than simply that God acts lovingly or God has love characteristics about him. God is Love. God is the very embodiment of love. But in order for God to be the very embodiment of love, God needs to have someone or something to love. And you could say to yourself or to me, you could say, but Pastor Dan, God has lots of people to love. God has all of us that he created to love. And who knows how many other beings throughout this universe to love or any other universe that he can love. But not only that, God has his creation that he can love, all of the things and animals and so on that God can love. Ah, but then Pastor Dan says, but that wasn't always the case. There was a time before time when there was only God. Only God has no beginning and no end. And so in that time when there was only God and nothing had yet been created, not the angels in heaven, not the people on earth, nothing, when, when God was by God's self, was there, how could God be love? God could be love because God, though God is one, has always and forever been in relationship within God's self among the three. See, God is so much the perfect embodiment of love that Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are one, one God, three persons. Remember, how the Bible talks about how a, a, a man will leave his parents and cleave to his wife and the two shall become one. Ideally, in your marriage relationship, if you are married, uh, you move ever towards this oneness, this unity. You are still two distinct persons, but you learn more and more what it means to be one, hopefully. God, however, has always been the three in one. God has always been in perfect, loving relationship within God's self. And so when God says in Genesis that he is going to, he says, let us create humankind in our image, when he says that, when God says that, he's discussing within God's self that three in one. He's saying, let us make humankind to love just as we love. And so we get back to Paul. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it is not to the flesh to live according to it. <clears throat> For if you live according to the flesh, this is verse 12, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. For those who are led by the Spirit of God, one person of the Trinity, are the children of God, God the Father, part, another part of the Trinity. The spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. It's not about, oh, I better obey the rules or I'm going to burn in hell. Instead, you get to be free. The spirit you receive brought about your adoption to sonship. Right? 
the Father and the Spirit, right? And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. You see, brothers and sisters, all three persons of the Trinity are here. And they teach us that we have been adopted. We have been adopted through Christ's sacrifice by the power of the Spirit so that our Father, we can cry out, Abba, Father. And our obligation now is not to live with the fear of a beating from God, but instead we get to live as God's children. We have become part of God's family. We no longer reach across the table and grab. We now say, please and thank you. Because now we are part of the family that says, please and thank you. We have that new identity. And of course, when I speak about saying please and thank you and passing the potatoes or the butter or whatever, it is a metaphor, of course, for how when God, the God who is love, adopts us, then we, our obligation, not through fear, but through opportunity and through identity, our obligation is to love, to become people of love, just as we were always created to be, to come back to being people of love. And so, brothers and sisters, we obey the commands of God, not out of fear, but out of love. We live out love in our lives because of love given to us. Brothers and sisters, this is why the Trinity matters. Because relationship, perfect, loving, love-embodied relationship is at the core of who God is. If God was one, but not in three persons, we could not say that God is love. And when God is love, and we are God's children, then we become love too. So, let us not beat around the bush. Let us not pretend that simply obeying the commandments to avoid the punishment is okay or good enough. Instead, let us remember that the very God who is, embodies, love, great three in one, has adopted us. And let us become love in his name and through his power because we are his children. Let us pray. Father in heaven, it is all good and well to read or to hear these words and to hear your call for us to become love just as you are love. But help us, O oh God, to do that practically. Help us, O oh God, to fulfill the obligation we have to live as Christ is in us. Help us to live abundantly and fully, and help us to do so in love. May we love the neighbor who lives next door. May we love the neighbor who is our co-worker. May we love the neighbor who is our fellow churchgoer. May we love the neighbor we bump into at the grocery store. May we love the person, the neighbor who smashes into our car by accident. May we even love the neighbor who smashes into our car on purpose. 
May we love the neighbor who is so different from us. May we love the neighbor who is poorer or richer or the neighbor who is different of a different ethnic background. May we love the neighbor who has a different moral compass. May we love the neighbor who is different politically. May we love the neighbor who hates us. And may we do so because we are your family. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.